This is Independence Hall in Philadelphia. In 1776, the Continental Congress gathered here in this room and declared the United States to be an independent nation. Eleven years later, in the spring of 1787, a different group of men met here. They drafted a constitution to secure the blessings of liberty to themselves and to you. This is the story of how, after much trial and error, the first event led to the second. When the American people dissolved their political connections with Great Britain, they defended their action with the Declaration of Independence, setting forth the principles on which, in their view, every free and just government must be founded. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government on such principles as to them shall seem most likely to affect their future safety and happiness. Winning independence would require a long and bloody war. Yet it was only the first act of the great drama. The second act involved an even more difficult task, as David Ramsey, the South Carolina patriot and historian said. In no age before, and in no other country, did man ever possess an election of the kind of government under which he would choose to live. Ancient free governments were thrown together by accident, the freedom of modern European governments was obtained by concessions or liberality of kings. In America alone, reason and liberty concurred in the formation. Of the Constitution, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let one of the sons of liberty, Joseph Warren, tell you how Americans treasured their long-sought liberty. Our fathers, having resolved never to wear the yoke of despotism and seeing the European world a prey to tyranny, bravely threw themselves upon the bosom of the ocean. Determined to find a place in which to enjoy their freedom or perish in the glorious attempt, they found a land swarming with savages who threatened death with every kind of torture. But death with torture was far less terrible than slavery. Joseph Warren was killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill near Boston. The British regular army sustained twice the casualties of the American militia, as the citizen soldiers were called. A military victory for the crown, a moral victory for the colonial. Warren's sentiments were echoed again and again at public meetings. The voice of your father's blood cries to you. In vain we crossed the boisterous ocean, found a new world and prepared it for the happy residence of liberty. In vain we toiled. In vain we fought. We bled in vain if you, our offspring, lack valor in your exertions for the preservation of your liberties. Oliver Ellsworth, Connecticut statesman and jurist, recalled in 1787, When we rushed to arms for preventing British usurpation, liberty was the argument on every tongue. This word would draw out a brigade of militia as rapidly as the most decisive orders of a despotic government. This word is sacred, next to those we appropriate for divine adoration. What was this liberty that men were willing to die for? The Massachusetts.
Massachusetts political writer Fisher Ames asked, What is the liberty of nature? Living exposed to the danger of being knocked on the head for a handful of acorns. There is no other liberty than civil liberty. We cannot live without government. During the 1770s, Americans of high station and low discussed the idea of civil liberty, of its blessings, and of the ways best to secure it. The Philadelphia lawyer John Dickinson said that liberty is best described in the Holy Scriptures, in these expressions, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. Richard Henry Lee, author of The Resolution for Independence, said, Liberty is the security to enjoy the effects of our honest industry and labors in a free and mild government, and personal liberty from all illegal restraints. A 17-year-old college student named Alexander Hamilton wrote, The only distinction between freedom and slavery is this. In a state of freedom, a man is governed by the laws to which he has given his consent, either in person or by his representative. In a state of slavery, he is governed by the will of another. In Essex County, Massachusetts, a public meeting pointedly discussed the issue of liberty and resolved, Political liberty is the right every man has to do whatever is not prohibited by laws to which he has given his consent. Consent. Almost all patriots agreed that consent was the keystone of free government, and most also agreed with a resolution unanimously adopted by the town meeting of Malden, Massachusetts. Resolved that the present age would be deficient in their duty to God, their posterity, and themselves, if they do not establish an American republic. This is the only form of government which we wish to see. Harvard graduate and Massachusetts lawyer John Adams elaborated, There is no good government but what is Republican, because the very definition of a republic is an empire of laws and not of men. That form of government which is best contrived to secure impartial and exact execution of the laws is the best of republics. The 13 states put these principles into practice in drawing up their state constitutions, only to learn that establishing free governments was not so easy. For one thing, there was more to Republican forms of government than merely getting rid of the king. Republics, it was commonly understood, could succeed only to the extent that the people devoted themselves to the interests of the public rather than to their own narrow concerns. John Adams argued what was involved. There must be a positive passion for the public good, superior to all private passions. I labor to procure a free constitution, and if my children do not prefer this to ample fortune, to ease and elegance, they are not my children, and I care not what becomes of them. They shall live upon thin diet, wear mean clothes, and work hard with cheerful hearts and free spirits. Let them revere nothing but religion, morality, and liberty. Such righteous dedication did not quite fit with the idea of Every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. It was also incompatible with human nature. It demanded too much. Ancient history taught that republics invariably declined in a regular progression. Order gave way to licentiousness or unrestrained liberty. Licentiousness gave way to anarchy, and anarchy gave way to tyranny. Many Americans feared that was in store for them. For as one of them put it, Half our learning is from the epitaphs on the tombstones of the ancient republics. Most agreed at first with Richard Henry Lee's proposition that The first maximum of man who loves liberty should be Never grant to rulers an atom of power that is not most clearly and indispensably necessary to the safety and well-being of society. 
But it was possible some thought for people to carry that maxim to extremes. Alexander Hamilton warned, The same state of passions which fits the multitude for opposition to tyranny and oppression very naturally leads them to a contempt and disregard for all authority. When minds are loosened from their attachment to ancient establishments and courses, they seem to grow giddy and are apt to run into anarchy. In such tempestuous times, it requires the greatest skill in the political pilots to keep men steady and within proper bounds. At every turn, Americans face this dilemma. How to preserve liberty without excess? How to preserve order without destroying liberty? The first state constitutions fail to place adequate restraints upon the popularly elected state legislatures. In the Articles of Confederation, the first attempt at forming a national government, the framers made the single-branched Continental Congress responsible for conducting the war, for carrying on foreign relations, and for handling other matters of national concern. But they gave Congress no power to tax and no power to enforce its decisions. A decade later, Benjamin Rush, physician and philosopher, analyzed what had happened. The Confederation, together with most of our state constitutions, were formed under very unfavorable circumstances. Although we understood perfectly the principles of liberty, most of us were ignorant of the forms and combinations of power in republics. In opposition to monarchy, we forgot that the temple of tyranny has two doors. We bolted one of them by proper restraints, but we left the other door open by neglecting to guard against the effects of our own ignorance and licentiousness. Less than two months after independence was declared, things began to go wrong. The American army under General Washington was forced to evacuate New York and retreat to Pennsylvania. Part of the army failed to make it, and the remainder was a shambles. Fearing that standing armies were dangerous to liberty and lacking power to draft recruits, Congress provided only for short-term enlistments of volunteers and counted heavily on militiamen. Washington said that the militias were ready to fly from their own shadows. And by year's end, the terms of most enlistments would expire. The desperateness of the situation he described later in a letter to his cousin. Making everything worse, he said, was that large numbers of civilians upon seeing the British Army suddenly lost their taste for independence and went over to the enemy. Your imagination can scarce extend to a situation more distressing. Our only dependence now is upon the speedy enlistment of a new army. If this fails, I think the game will be pretty well up. Having placed the Delaware River between himself and the enemy, Washington headed off disaster by a bold stroke. He knew that the British commander held to the theory that no army ever campaigned in the winter. So he recrossed the Delaware on December 26 to make a surprise attack on the Hessian troops of the British garrison at Trenton, New Jersey. Washington's army inflicted 300 casualties and took over 900 prisoners at the cost of a handful of American wounded. Popular morale improved and many volunteers enlisted. Yet Washington knew that he would never have enough strength to defeat the British head on. He would have to maneuver carefully and wait maybe for years until the British made some blunder which would give him a chance for a decisive attack. But it cost a great deal of money to keep an army in the field, and the Congress had very little. The states rarely paid their full quotas to Congress. Congress raised some funds by printing money backed by nothing but vague promises. 
Such paper rapidly lost its value, and soon a dollar was worth only two cents, giving rise to the expression, not worth the continental. In the fall of 1777, the American general Horatio Gates won a major victory at Saratoga in upstate New York, but his envy of Washington kept him from cooperating, and as a result, the British took Philadelphia. Washington's army retreated to Valley Forge. It was a dreadful winter. An army doctor described in his letters, a soldier, bare feet, his legs naked from the tattered remains of an only pair of stockings, his breeches not sufficient to cover his nakedness, his shirt hanging in strings, his face meager. He cried, I am sick, my feet lame, my legs are sore, and all the reward I shall get will be, poor Will is dead. Hamilton, now serving as Washington's aide-de-camp, perceived the root of the problem. It is a melancholy truth that there is not in Congress so much wisdom as there ought to be. Folly, caprice, a want of foresight characterize the general tenor of their actions. Their conduct is feeble, indecisive, and improvident. We are reduced to a more terrible situation than you can conceive. They have exposed the army frequently to the danger of dissolution from absolute famine. It is to be wondered at that the soldiers have shown so unparalleled a degree of patience. If effectual measures are not speedily adopted, I know not how we shall keep the army together. Washington managed to keep the army together for three more years, but the British steadily expanded the territory under their control. The low point in the American cause came in January 1781, when troops from Pennsylvania and New Jersey rose in mutinies. Congress finally roused itself and reorganized its administrative departments. Robert Morris, a brilliant merchant, was given the new job of superintendent of finance. By skillfully using his own limited resources, and by borrowing money from Holland, Morris was able to supply the army for another few months. Then Washington got the chance he'd long been waiting for. He trapped the main British army at Yorktown, Virginia. And suddenly in October 1781, the war was won. That ended the first crisis arising from the weakness of government. Washington moved his headquarters to a farmhouse in Newburgh, New York, while the peace treaty was being negotiated. The army was encamped nearby and held ready to resume the fight if peace negotiations failed. The soldiers were anxious to get home, but they'd not been paid in years. They didn't want to disband without the pay and bonuses they'd been promised. The army sent three officers to present a petition to Congress demanding action. The officers also consulted with civilians who had lent money or supplies to Congress. Plans were made to coordinate the efforts of military and civilian creditors to force Congress to act. This was a dangerous combination. Virtually every revolution in the history of the world has ended in dictatorship. And for three tense months, it appeared as if the American Revolution might end that way too. The crisis came to a head in early 1783, when anonymous pamphlets were circulated among the officers. One proposed that if fighting should resume, the army remove to the wilderness and abandon the nation. If peace takes place, the pamphlet went on. Never sheathe your swords until you have obtained full and ample justice. But Washington had never forgotten that the war had been fought for the cause of liberty. To the surprise of the mutineers, 
he showed up at their meeting. He had written a short speech. And when he took it from his pocket, he reached with his other hand and drew out a pair of eyeglasses, which only a few close friends knew he needed. Gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. There might, gentlemen, be an impropriety in my taking notice of anonymous pamphlets. But this dreadful alternative of either deserting our country in the extremest hour of her distress, or turning our arms against it, has something so shocking in it that humanity revolts at the idea. I spurn it as every man who regards that liberty and reveres that justice for which we contend undoubtedly must. The officers wept tears of shame and the mutiny was dissolved. As Thomas Jefferson remarked later, the moderation and virtue of George Washington probably prevented this revolution from being closed by a subversion of the liberty it was intended to establish. During the next few years, some of the state governments functioned reasonably well, but others nearly degenerated into chaos. David Ramsey remarked that, There is a languor in the states that forebodes ruin. In 1775, there was more patriotism in a village than there is now in the 13 states. The Confederation government limped along, unable to pay its debts or solve its other problems. Congressman Rufus King, soon to be a member of the Constitutional Convention, wrote to his colleague Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts. The Treasury is literally without a penny. Then, in the winter of 1786, a fresh crisis arose in the New England backcountry. Led by ex-Continental Army Captain Daniel Shays, Groups of malcontents went around closing county courts to prevent the collection of taxes and the enforced payment of debts. Emboldened by their success, they talked of marching on Boston to plunder the state capital. Liberty indeed was degenerating into anarchy. Henry Knox, superintendent of war, sent the news of Shea's rebellion to Washington at Mount Vernon. Washington spread the news to his friends around the country. He wrote to James Madison in Virginia. How melancholy that in so short a space we should have made such large strides toward fulfilling the prediction of our British enemies. Leave them to themselves and their government will soon dissolve. What stronger evidence can be given of the want of energy in our governments than these disorders? What security has a man of life, liberty, or property? Thirteen sovereignties pulling against each other and all tugging at the federal head will soon bring ruin on the whole. Whereas an energetic constitution, well guarded and closely watched to prevent encroachments, might restore us to that degree of respectability and consequence which we had the brightest prospect of attaining. Madison recognized that our situation is becoming every day more critical. People of reflection unanimously agree that the existing Confederacy is tottering to its foundations. Many individuals are suspected of leaning towards monarchy. Other individuals predict a partition of the states into two or more confederacies. But Madison and a few others, including Alexander Hamilton, and John Dickinson had already moved toward finding a happier solution. In Annapolis, Maryland, delegates from several states had convened in September 1786 to discuss economic problems. The three statesmen urged that a circular letter be sent to Congress and the state governors proposing that a general convention should meet at Philadelphia on the second Monday in May 1787 to revise the entire American system of government. 
Initially, the states were not interested in the idea, but the news of Shea's rebellion jolted them into action. By spring, all but Rhode Island had chosen representatives to the Grand Convention. The convention began its work at the end of May. The nation waited breathlessly. The passage of 11 years since the Declaration had changed the scene. Patrick Henry, John Hancock, and others who'd been central to events in 1776 were not there. Jefferson was in Paris. Adams was in London. The torch had been passed to other hands, many of whom, including Hamilton and Madison, had been too young in 1776. The Connecticut poet, Joel Barlow, captured the popular mood. Much is expected from the federal convention now sitting. If ever there was a time in any age or nation where the fate of millions depended on the voice of one body, it is the present period. Every free citizen of the American empire ought now to consider himself as the legislator of half mankind. George Mason, one of the Virginia delegates, expressed the people's hopes and fears. The eyes of the United States are turned upon this assembly and their expectations raised to a very anxious degree. May God grant we may be able to gratify them by establishing a wise and just government. On September 17, 1787, the work of the convention was completed. Fifty-five men had participated. Thirty-nine signed the finished document. They had produced something unprecedented in all the ages, a fundamental law, a law governing government itself. In this, all concurred with George Washington, who had presided over the Constitutional Convention. The preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered as deeply, perhaps as finally staked on the experiment and trusted to the hands of the American people. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America.